The Panasonic G7 came out in May of 2015, so this means it's five years old already. Many cameras have come out since then, but I think this is such a good camera, especially for the price in today's market. So now let's jump into the settings. Just make sure you have a fresh battery in before we start. And this is where you can put in your SD card as well. I'll leave links in the description for the SD cards I recommend. All right, so let's turn on the camera with this switch up top and we have successfully turned on the camera. So this very front dial here, this is where we can control the aperture. So this number right here, f3.5, this is our aperture number. So the bigger that number is, the darker the um, image becomes. And then this 50 is our shutter. We can adjust this with the back dial right here. And again, lower, brighter, higher is darker. But we're actually going to set this very specifically with our frame rate of choice. With ISO, you can press this button and you can rotate the exposure. And then the white balance button here adjusts our color. So if you're shooting outdoors, you wanna be shooting at sunlight or cloudy or shade. And indoors, most of the time it's tungsten light. And then there's even options for custom white balance, which comes in handy. So those are your basic controls. We have our record button right up next to the camera. We can also use the shutter button to press record as well. We have our playback button, play back your footage or your photos to preview them. By pressing the display button, we basically change the way we're looking at the image. We have some tools we can set up. So this is our little balance, make sure we're level. If you wanna get into the menus, we can press this menu button right in the middle and now we are into the menus of the Panasonic G7. The first thing I want to do is make sure you are on the camera tab in the very first tab. Let's change our photo style. If you are looking for a quick and easy way to just shoot your footage and upload it to YouTube, I recommend using one of the profiles already provided. So natural, um, vivid, any one of these work great. Now, if you are doing more color grading and you're doing more editing and post, you might be wanting to use one of these flatter profiles like Cinelec D or Cinelec V. Down here, you can adjust things like contrast. You can minus five will reduce contrast or bring it up. Again, if you're just uploading to YouTube, don't want any hassle with it, just leave all these settings at zero. Press the menu button again, and let's go down to record format. There's two different options here, AVC HD and MP4. I recommend sticking with MP4 for the majority of your shooting. Um, AVCHD has a few extra options for lower quality settings, but most of the time, just stick with MP4. Go down to record quality. You probably have bought this camera because you want to be shooting in 4K, and that's the highest quality this camera can shoot at. So either choose 24 or 30 frames per second. Either one of these are going to give you the highest quality looking video. Now for those instances when you want to be using slow motion, you need to record in a higher frame rate. And the only way to do that is to drop the resolution to 1080. So full HD, 60 frames per second, allows you to slow your footage down by 40% in post. And then some of these options down here, there's 30 frames per second in 1080, um, there's 720p and VGA, but we are not gonna be needing that. If we were to go to AVC HD, these options change. The maximum we can go is to 1080, 60, but we can shoot at 1080, 24 frames per second, which we don't have in MP4. But yeah, let's go back to MP4, shoot 4K, 24 frames per second. Let's scroll down here to the exposure mode, and we are going to change this to manual. There's different ways you can, this camera will try to guess the settings for you. Program mode is going to set the exposure automatically for you. If you're very new to this camera and don't know how to manually control exposure, um, you can use this. However, the more you are familiar with your camera, I recommend shooting in manual. Some of these other settings are good for photography, but for video, we're gonna stick with manual. Continuous autofocus is something you can mess around with. Um, if we turn this on, it will continually track autofocus in your video. This is helpful if you're vlogging or you know filming yourself. However, this camera in particular doesn't have the best autofocus. In some situations, it won't actually focus on you. So use this at your own caution. Um, just you have to know the instances where it might work. 
So I'm going to leave this off for now. Now let's keep scrolling down to eye dynamic and eye resolution. Turn these off. If we go back up to highlight shadow, again, if you are more of a professional and you want to really customize your camera, um, you can control the highlight and shadow, um, how it records that. So if we were to lower our highlights and bring up the shadows, we get a little bit more detail and information in those areas. However, you do risk getting some artifacts if we push the footage too much. Let's keep scrolling down here. Go down to silent operation. If you want to have a silent camera, you don't want any buttons to make any noises like me. Uh, I recommend turning this on. That way you're not you know, disturbing an event. For instance, having your shutter or your record button go off, it's a little annoying. Go down to mic level display and we can turn this on if we are recording audio. This pops up right up here and as you can see, it's telling me how loud things get or how quiet things get. Just so you know, I'm actually recording audio. And we can turn this on or off depending what we want. Mic level adjustment, I have always kept this at zero. Now when you plug in mics, this is basically how you can adjust the volume of that. So if you go way down, it's not going to pick up the audio as much. And if we go plus 6 dB, this is picking up, it's like turning the volume way up. But let's stick to zero. And I recommend turning the mic level limiter on. This will make sure that the highest points aren't too loud. That way it will keep the audio relatively um, clean. So I recommend this, it's just an easy way to make sure your audio is sounding good. However, if you are more professional, um, you know what to do. You can turn that on or off depending on your needs. Right, let's go back to this tab here. Make sure your silent mode is on. Again, it kind of keeps the camera silent and avoid getting uh, any random noises. Now I want to touch on some focus tools to help you achieve focus. The first thing we can adjust is this manual focus assist button. And if I were to leave this on this icon right here, as I adjust the focus ring on my camera, a number of things are happening. One is kind of showing up a little box, enlarging the frame, so I can see what's in focus. And that white outline is actually another feature called peaking. You can see that it's outlining what's in focus. Now this actually won't be recorded in your video. This is only a preview to help you make sure you are in focus. If we go back, we can turn that on or off or even change the color of it if we so desire. And we can turn off manual focus assist altogether so that way we're not bothered with that little box popping on or off. But I'm gonna turn it on because I wanna show you this setting here, manual focus assist display. We change that from that little box to having the full screen be enlarged. So depending on what you find better, um, you can change it with that setting. If we ever need to decide which autofocus mode we are in, we can do this on the back of this little toggle here. Switching that to MF will allow us to control the manual focus on the camera lens. Or if we go to AFS slash AFF, we can actually use the shutter button to achieve focus, which is um, a little easier way to grab focus quickly. Now there's a few exposure tools in this camera as well. So one of them is the histogram, which I have on already. This is primarily a photography exposure tool. And basically the things on the left of the frame is dark and the things on the right is bright. So if I were to rotate this, you can see how by changing my settings, things are being moved from the right to the left, showing me what's dark and what's not. And the ideal thing is to have everything generally in the middle of the frame for proper exposure. A more dedicated exposure tool for video is zebra patterns. And this will show you the brightest points and it'll give you a pattern like a zebra telling you what is too bright. This will actually look, you know, clipped in your video when you upload it. So this gives you a general reference of where your brightest points are and you can just judge it um, what parts are white and what's not. So things like the sun might be really bright like that and that's fine. So if you're filming people, you wanna make sure these zebra patterns aren't really on their skin at all. Another way to determine if you are properly exposed is with this exposure meter right here. As you see, there's a zero and a negative three or a positive three, depending on which side of the exposure you're on. 
these are stops. So if it's near plus three, that means it's three stops overexposed. So currently we're about two thirds of a stop overexposed. So I can just rotate my ISO until it hits zero and that's saying I'm properly exposed. However, this is just a guideline. So as you can see, those zebras are telling me that that part is a little bright. So I can bring that back down a little bit and that looks like a bit better of an exposure. So do make sure that it looks good on the back of the screen to your eye and use this as a guideline. In general, it's okay to be under a stop or over a stop, but if your exposure meter looks like something like this, you are clearly underexposed. So you can just raise it back up until you are in the ballpark. Going under guideline, this is a tool for composition and framing, and there's different options to choose from. The most familiar is this rule of thirds. If you've taken a basic photography course, this helps you frame up your shots for a more general pleasing image. And you can have this displayed on the camera um, so that way it can help you with composition. One of my favorite features of the Panasonic G7 is how customizable it is. And this is where we can actually fit it to tailor our needs. Function button set. If we press this and go into the record mode, any of these function buttons we can actually change. So let's say we want to change function button two. This is the quick menu already, but we can go throughout this and change it to any setting we want. So things like zebra patterns, guidelines, those options that we have in the menu, we can switch it over to access it from the back of the camera. Out of the box, it works great, but this allows you more flexibility if you do desire that. Towards the beginning, I showed you how you could use the button in the middle of the shutter dial to change back to white balance and ISO. To do that is underneath this dial set tab and go down to dial operation switch up and that will allow you to switch in between the white balance and ISO. Now there's also other methods for changing your aperture and shutter speed dials. Let's say you wanted the shutter speed to be the front dial. You can change that right here. This is custom set menu. This is a great way to add some customization to your camera. That way when you're shooting, you don't have to go back into the menus and fiddle around with settings. So we see C1, C2, and C3. These are basically saving profiles to the camera. And we can access that when we rotate this dial from movie record to the C. This is our custom little dial here. And once I toggle back and forth, a number of things are changing. One is getting a little darker, and I'm also shooting in 60 frames per second. I like having this tab saved to 60 frames per second. That way, if I need to toggle between just regular video and slow motion, I can do it quickly and easily. This has my saved appropriate shutter speed um, and the right frame rate to record all that. And if you want to do the same, all you have to do is set up your settings first in this setting. So let's say if I want to switch it to, I want to save it to slow motion and I like all my other settings, I just go here and I'll save this to custom one. Now that's done. As you can see, when I switch back and forth, it's saved to 1080 and then I can use my regular record tab to have my regular 4K video. And so now effectively as I rotate, you can see all my settings are staying the same, except um, quickly and easily changing to 60 frames per second. And if you go into the menus when you're still on the custom dial, you'll have the option to choose between three different options or presets. So you can have a number of different settings saved up um, and then you can choose between which one you feel like using. So it's a great way to customize your camera. That way you don't have to be bothered with settings um, when you're shooting. One more setting in this tab is shoot without lens. If you are using adapted lenses or vintage lenses, it'll show a warning saying there's no lens attached, are you sure? Um, turning this on will just, the camera knows you are shooting without a lens, um, even though you do have a lens on. So you can leave this on if you do plan on using vintage lenses. So that's it for that tab. Let's go to the last wrench icon. This is general settings like setting your clock and time, but the only things we really need to be concerned about is going down to live view mode. You can choose to display the frame rate at 60 or 30 frames per second on this screen. 
I think 30 frames per second is enough and I think that it will help on battery life. So I just choose 30. Again, we can change the brightness of the camera screen as well from a lower to um, automatic brightness. If we scroll down here, we will actually find where our current firmware version is. So if you ever need to check this and make sure it's on the latest firmware, you can do so. And if we scroll down, the last thing we'll regularly access is format. And format will erase everything off the card and it's good practice to do this before each shoot. Just make sure you are backed up the night before and then you can format the day you're shooting. That way you have the whole card freed up to record for that day. And that is it for the menu settings. We have properly set it up for proper video. So those are the general camera settings that you need to pay attention to. As you get more familiar with the camera, you'll begin to understand more of the nerdy stuff about it. No camera is without its flaws, and of course this applies to the Panasonic G7. One con that can be easily fixed is the recording limit. In fact, you can install a, you can put this into a service mode and it allows you to record unlimited 4K video. So typically where there would be a 30 minute limit, this allows you to open up and record as long as you have enough memory space and enough battery, and you can keep recording. Similarly to that, the camera breaks up each video file by four gigabyte clips. So if you are recording for 30 minutes, it's gonna split those up into separate clips. Not a deal breaker by any means, but you will have to keep that in mind. So as briefly mentioned in the video, the Panasonic G7 doesn't have the best autofocus. It can be usable in some instances, but I wouldn't recommend solely relying on that. If that's something you're definitely gonna need, there are some Canon cameras out there, but I think the Panasonic G7 has by far superior video quality. And the last of the major cons is the camera is not very good in low light situations. But I don't think that's a total deal breaker. I think if you learn how to light your videos, then you'll by far get a better looking video anyway. But if you know you're gonna be shooting a lot of events and not being able to light things, you might wanna look at a different camera for that. But I think for 90% of people, this camera is an awesome beginner camera. You can really push it to its limits before really needing to upgrade. So I hope you enjoyed this video on the Panasonic G7. I know there's a lot of people still interested in this camera, even in 2020. So if you like this video, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe to watch more videos like these. Thanks for watching.